Western Music Podcast. The word trailblazer is oft overused, but I feel no compunction in using it to describe today's guest. In fact, although she's just at the start of what promises to be a stellar career, she's blazing not just one trail, but it might count at least three. Firstly, as the Director of Music at Pembroke College, Cambridge. Secondly, as a broadcaster on TV and radio. And lastly, and most importantly for the show today, as an organist. And her debut organ recital, Images, recorded at the Organ of Ely Cathedral, we were released on Signum Classics as a CD and download on September the 3rd. Welcome to the show, Anna Lapwood. Thank you so much, it's lovely to be here. Anna's album breaks from a more traditional view of the organ, rather than featuring the music of J.S. Bach or the French symphonic organ tradition, exemplified by the likes of Charles-Marie Vidor, it instead focuses on a more intimate, impressionist side of the instrument, with the main event, for me at least, being her own arrangement of Benjamin Britten's four C interludes from his opera, Peter Grimes. As we're about to find out, though, Anna certainly hasn't abandoned these great organ traditions, and on the show today we'll take a look at these three very different facets of the organ world. Before that, though, Anna, what first drew you to the organ? I gather in your youth you were equally proficient at a very different instrument. Yes, I trained as a harpist, uh, or rather I should say, actually, I just took up as many instruments as was <laughs> physically possible. I remember so many teachers saying to me, now, Anna, you really need to stop when I got to kind of instrument four, instrument five. Um, but I loved translating sounds between different instruments and seeing how you could take the same piece and play it on a different instrument and find a completely different meaning in the piece. Um, and so, yeah, I played the piano, violin, viola, harp, focused on harp uh, towards the end of my time at school and then discovered the organ sort of by accident. Uh, my dad was a priest and so I spent quite a lot of time in churches and my mum just said to me one day, have you thought about taking up the organ and going for an organ scholarship when you go to university? They were fed up of carting the harp around for you. Exactly. But in a typical teenage fashion, I said, oh, don't be ridiculous, mum. I play too many instruments already. Uh, and she then said to me, oh, but you could get a grand piano in your room as an organ scholar. I hear that's something they do. Uh, so that was my kind of routine. And then I... Um, fell in love with the instrument not immediately I found it very very hard at first and it was by far the hardest instrument I'd ever played and I think that sort of added to the appeal in a way I was like right I really want to tackle this. Well the music of J.S. Bach remains central to the lives of organists everywhere. If it is possible to answer such a question what is it about the music of Bach that makes it retain this place? It's a really good question and a difficult question. I think part of it is the fact that He's completely unsurpassed in terms of the quality and quantity of his writing for the instrument. Here we have a composer who knows the instrument so well and knows how to write in a way that is satisfying for the listener and for the organist, which is always an important thing. Um, I mean, the, the level of contrapuntal ingenuity is extraordinary. And I guess there's also the fact that if you're a liturgical organist, there is a piece of Bach for every possible occasion. Uh, it's like a, an amazing database of music perfectly suited for every church service you could possibly want. But then on a personal level, I think I certainly find myself that uh, I tend to turn to Bach at times of stress or times of sorrow. I mean, uh, Obama Dich, which is one of my favourites, chorales, uh, I, when my grandfather died, that was the piece I went and played on the organ just because it felt like the right thing to do and I think that gets to the sort of level of things that it's, it's slightly hard to put into words why we're drawn to it but it just sums up human experience so wholly and so perfectly. And we can sample Obama Dich BWV 721 played by someone who for me and I'm sure many other people was their introduction to the organ works of J.S. Bach, Peter Herford.
This chorale prelude reminds us that Bach's music was of course written for Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God. Is there a bit of tension in the organ world between the sacred and the secular and the idea that music written for an express religious purpose can be enjoyed shorn of the religious context? Oh, that's a very good question. I don't think I see it as a tension, personally. I think I know a lot of organists for whom music kind of becomes their religion in a way. I mean, personally, I don't quite know where I stand on religion and its associated things, but I think none of us can deny that we've all had experiences often involving music where we experience a sense of otherness and a togetherness, which is extraordinary and it makes me sort of say, well, surely there must be something bigger and beyond us if that experience can exist. Um, and I guess it's about seeing music as a gateway into those experiences and um, people can then choose where they go from there. I think our job is to sort of lay it out on the table and say, here is music, here is this beautiful thing. If it, for you, takes you deeper into worship, brilliant. If, for another person, it's just a chance for them to meditate and relax and be with themselves, then that's also brilliant, I think. That, that's an equally valid response. Yeah. And what have you picked as a second excerpt from Works of J.S. Bach? The, uh, the other uh, piece of Bach which I just, it brings me so much joy, is the St. Anne Prelude. I, I, this is one where I really can't describe why I love it. It just, it feels incredible to play. Uh, so I guess I can describe why I love it. It feels incredible to play. Uh, and one of the things I love about the organ is it does involve your entire body. And so you go to put down a big chord on the piano. It's obviously your hands and your, your feet kind of rooted on the floor. But on the organ, when you're really going for it, you feel it. It's like you feel it going from head to toe and you are really embodying the music. And I think for me, the St. Anne, the Prelude and the Fugue, uh, sort of uh, the, the best example of that I can think of in Bach. Let's sample it now, performed by David Good at the Organ and Trinity Chapel, Cambridge. This is from Bach's Klavier Ubung. 250 years after his death, does Bach's music remain the ultimate training manual for organ performance? God, these are really good questions. Um, yes, I think so, <laughs> in that there is something for, there's something for everyone, and I don't mean that in a trite way. I mean that a beginner can find as much in Bach as uh, someone who's been playing the organ for 50 years. And I think one of the things that I love, I think one of the other excerpts I mentioned to you is the little G minor fugue. Uh, that was the first piece where I sort of had this realisation where I'd been playing that piece for years and I suddenly had a moment where I discovered another sort of hidden fugue subject. And I just remember this sheer excitement and running up to a friend of mine and saying, look, 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 I found another subject. And they kind of looked at me as if to say, oh, OK. <laughs> but, You've cracked the Da Vinci Code. Exactly. But it... As, <laughs> there's always something more and that's I, I mean that's the joy of music isn't it but particularly in Bach there's always something that you haven't discovered yet and yeah that that joy of finding these little things for the first time that never goes away and let's see what people can discover for the first time as we have an excerpt of the little G minor fugue BWV 578 performed by Ulrich Burma.
What are the specific qualities about the organ that make it ideal for fugal writing? I definitely get the sense that in the right hands and feet, of course, you can get a much greater sense of contrapuntal clarity on an organ than, say, the piano. I think it goes back to this idea of being able to embody every single line. I mean, obviously, if you're playing, say, I don't know, a five-part fugue on the piano, you're talking about splitting fingers. <laughs> Whereas on the organ, obviously, we do do that as well, but our feet tend to have a, a dedicated line. In some cases, two dedicated lines, one on each foot. That's when things start to get a bit tricky. Um, but, uh, there's, yeah, there's something about that. I mean... I'm trying to think, uh, in BWV 547, which is the C major prelude and fugue, the 9-8 prelude, and then there's this fugue where it's just your hands for most of the fugue. Um, and then there's this amazing moment on the final two pages where your feet suddenly come in with this um, elongated fugal entry. And it feels like, ah, oh, to play it, it feels like your I don't know. I really. I was going to say that the world's ending, but that's too negative. It, it the moment your feet come in is extraordinary, and it goes back to this idea of embodying the music. You are really feeling it in your entire body instead of just in your in your fingertips. If that makes sense. I suppose for a four part fugue, you can have one for each uh, part of you that's playing the instrument, and then it gets more complicated once you get to five and six. Yeah, it's sort of, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Could you introduce your mammoth Barkathons, which have drawn together international performers and audiences to perform the music of J.S. Bach to raise money for charity? Yes, the Barkathon, gosh, uh, that started as a little idea and it's now been, uh, we've just had our fifth one, so it's been going for five years. It started uh, as a last minute attempt to raise some money for a choir tour I was organising to go to Zambia. So I work in Zambia every year and I have been taking Pembroke Choir out, or I was meant to take them out again this year. It obviously didn't happen because of Covid, but they come with me and we teach music and it's an extraordinary experience. It's an amazing part of the world. The people are some of the most extraordinary people I've ever encountered. But we thought, right, we need to raise some more money. Let's do a silly thing where we do the complete organ works in 24 hours. I think the first time we did it, I organised it with about two weeks notice. <laughs> and that was, and it was a little bit hit and miss in that we had a spreadsheet up in the loft and I was just sort of saying, calling out BWV numbers. And <laughs> we were, eh, anyone want to play this one? And ticking them off as we go, bit of sight reading, quite a lot of sight reading. But then it, it, since then it's grown into something far more important uh, in my mind in that it has become this community of organists who are involved every year. I think this year we had 90 organists from all over the world, some online, some in person. And I think it's a really important opportunity for organists to talk to other organists and be with other organists because it's a very lonely job. We're so often sitting in an organ loft by ourselves uh, and we don't get that many opportunities to all sort of come together and share interpretations and things like that. So it's become this amazing thing. It's always the most stressful week of my year because trying to coordinate that many people and that many recordings is a bit of a nightmare but every time it, it, it's 100 percent worth it and people have been really generous in their donations as well so hopefully long may it continue yeah perhaps there's this idea of Bach's music as a sort of langra franca something that unites organists and audiences the world over and there's perhaps a juxtaposition between that and actually Bach's quite parochial life and the fact that he didn't really move very far so it's perhaps only music where you could have this occasion where someone who wasn't a great traveller could create something which can travel the world over. Completely it, and I totally get what you're what you're saying about sort of it being music that brings people together because you can hear I don't know a hundred different versions of the same piece and you can still find it goes back to what I was saying about finding something new in it you can still find something different every time I remember listening to David Good's complete bark I didn't listen to the complete bark because that would have taken quite a while but dipping in and out of it and I just, uh, I loved the fact that in his recording, the pieces were so full of humour and life and energy. And uh, he put in all these outrageous extra ornaments that just gave the music this freshness that I hadn't heard before. And uh, yeah, I love that about it. I love that you can turn in so many different directions and hear so many different interpretations. And you can sit in a pub with 10 organists and everyone does a slightly different fingering for the beginning of the G major prelude and things like that it's it's great you also mentioned their uh, audiences is it particularly difficult as an organist to connect with audiences as you said you're there 
up there in the organ loft and the audience is far removed. And perhaps your involvement on social media are sort of attempts to sort of try and connect the organist with the audience. Completely. I think one of the issues facing organists is that we are asking our audiences to engage with the music in quite a different way if they're coming to a concert. So if you think about a normal concert, you go and it's a visual spectacle and it's an oral spectacle. For the organ, if there isn't a screen, and now quite a lot of people are introducing screens, but if there isn't a screen, you are asking people to only listen. And that is a very different process. I mean, the thing that I always use as an analogy here is when I was little-ish, when I was young, I used to watch The X Factor, which I haven't watched for some years, but I used to watch The X Factor and I would watch it and go, wow, that was amazing. And then I would download the single. So it was exactly the same, but it was just the audio. And I would suddenly go, oh, hang on a minute, that note <laughs> wasn't quite in tune. And, and I would nip, I was a really cool child, <laughs> you could tell. But I would, I would listen to it and I would think, hang on a minute, that wasn't the performance I heard at all. And I think, yeah, as soon as we are only listening, we are listening in a more critical way, just because that's how it works. We don't have anything to distract our brain. And if that's all organ audiences here then how are they going to compare that to, say, a violin performance where they're seeing the emotions so much more directly? Um, so, yeah, I think uh, for me, social media is hopefully a good way to sort of get behind, uh, behind the loft door, as it were, and show people that the organ is just as emotive and just as expressive and just as exciting as any other instrument, if not more so. Yeah, and well, it's even more virtuosic, isn't it? Because you say you're using your feet as well as your hands, and it's a great pity that the audiences don't really get to see that. Well, I mean, uh, the organ prom last year, Jonathan Scott's organ prom, I thought that was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen. And the fact that they had the cameras right up underneath his bench so you could see what his feet were doing, you could see all the buttons... I saw nothing but praise for that online and so many people saying I had no idea this is what it meant to be an organist. And I think I hope that we're going to see more of that kind of thing, more organ recitals on TV and more uh, coverage of the instrument because honestly it's a no-brainer. It's such a fascinating instrument if you get up close and personal with it and it's not held at a distance. Well, the world of the French symphonic organ is far removed from Bach's conception of the instrument. Can you pick some highlights from a tradition which elevated the organ from the world of the church to the world of the concert hall, even if its most famous composers were connected to the famous Caval Col instrument at the Church of saint sulpice in Paris? This is another interesting one. Uh, I think the organ repertoire, perhaps more than any other instrument, is so dependent on developments in organ buildings. So uh, the Cavaillacol instruments in France can kind of ushered in a completely new style of music because for the first time, uh, these instruments were replicating orchestral sounds as opposed to kind of being an, being an organ. They could suddenly pretend to be an oboe or strings and these lush beds of sound. Uh, it was also when the um, pedal pedals kind of expanded, so they had their own stops which meant that you could uh, use them in much more virtuosic ways. So uh, that was when sort of French organists could properly play Bach for the first time. Um, and in terms of picking a highlight, I mean, gosh, there's so much. But something that a piece I've been playing recently is um, uh, some Vidor, not the famous Vidor, which I confess is a piece that I detest uh, for obvious reasons, because we're asked to play it too much. No, no, no. But um, the, the Vidor's Sixth Symphony, the final movement, is so exciting. There's this huge coda at the end where you just feel like you're flying over the keys, you're doing octaves in your feet um, and these repeated cadences in your hands. And when you're playing it on a big French instrument, when you're playing on a proper cavalier col, the sound is one of the hugest things you could possibly imagine and it's just excellent fun. Great. Well, let's sample that before my Marie-Claire Alain, a true legend amongst organists.
comparing these organ symphonies to the world of Bach, one of the most noticeable differences, as you've said, is the dramatic changes in dynamics now possible. How is this achieved, both technically and how is it executed by the organist? Well, on an organ we basically have uh, stops, so uh, the, it, it, I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe a stop. It is a thing that you pull out and as you pull it out it activates that certain sound and then you can combine all these different sounds together to create whatever effect you want. Um, and a lot of the time if you see a French organist playing on one of these cavalier coles, they'll have an assistant on each side pulling out lots and lots of stops for them. Nowadays, on kind of more modern instruments, that process tends to be uh, done with buttons that we press uh, so you can set up the sounds you want on a computer and it sort of does it for you. But I think the dynamic range is something that's so important to talk about because, again, we think of the organ and we go, oh, yes, loud, hmm, vidor, yay. But actually, some of the most extraordinary sounds that it can make are the quiet ones. And in fact, the other piece of vidor that I was talking to you about which is the um, Andante Sostenuto from his Symphony Gothique. That is a chance to hear the richness and beauty and intimacy of these much quieter sounds. They have a thickness to them. Um, so it's a lot of eight foot stops together. So a lot of stops of the same pitch all together. They've got a thickness and a body to them. And there's something about it where you feel like as soon as you hear those opening notes on that particular sound it's like you've stepped into one of these vast french cathedrals and can smell a little bit of incense in the air and can see the sun coming i mean it just it paints such an amazing oral picture of the place where we get to experience this incredible music but even though saying that these are secular symphonies so again it's this organist having this sort of relationship between the sacred and the secular yeah, I mean, uh, so this, but uh, as organists, we play this music after services. We play it in in recital, and I think, uh, yeah, how how do we decide whether a piece of music is sacred or not? I mean, if it doesn't have a text, which obviously organ music doesn't tend to, uh, I mean, some of them, yes, will have sort of links to plain song, but it, I guess it's more the setting uh, where we perform the music or when we perform the music that determines whether it's sacred or secular. Not sure. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's sample the Andante Sostenuto from Vidor's Ninth Organ Symphony, the Gothic. Uh, this is performed by Joseph Nolan at the organ of La Madeleine, Paris. I think Vidor's organ symphonies are the most significant contributions to the organ repertoire since Bach. Oh gosh, I mean, how do we say what is significant? Uh, yes, I think uh, Vidor, Franck, um, Vienne, they were so important in sort of changing the direction of organ writing. Uh, and we, you talked earlier about sort of whether Bach is a useful teaching tool, I think the same applies uh, to those composers. But yeah, how do we define uh, what, who is the most important? It's, a, it's about a kind of broad picture, I think. They're perhaps analogous to what Beethoven did for the symphony, the orchestral symphony, in that they greatly expanded the scope and potential of the music. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And they're also great fun to play. <laughs> Well, as you mentioned, you briefly did mention there the impact of that technological change. And for me, the world of technological change seems to have had a greater impact on the organ than perhaps any other instrument going. I think perhaps if you'd say in the 16th century, perhaps the organ was the most sophisticated machine that was ever made by any human. And what are some of the impacts that modern technology is now having on organs and organists? 
I think a lot of non-organists don't realise quite how tech heavy the organ is. I mean, they're not all, so you can, I mean, our organ at Pembroke, for example, has absolutely no uh, bells and whistles. It's just a, a, a straight organ and we have to do everything by hand. Other than blowing it, it has an electronic blower, but everything else is mechanical. Uh, but if you look at uh, most cathedral instruments now, they rely on quite sophisticated computer software uh, in order to, as I said earlier, to set all the sounds that you want. I mean, there are all sorts of fun bells and whistles, literal bells, literal whistles. Uh, there's an organ in Newcastle under Lyme, which has a stop called the tibia liquida, and you pull it in a little <laughs> drinks cabinet opens with lights. So that's a great, a great technological advance in my view. There's also, um, I mean, there, there's organs now with buttons that you press which turn the page of an iPad and it, uh, all this stuff probably sounds a little silly the drinks cabinet is a little bit tongue in cheek but actually as an organist there is so much to think about in a performance because every organ is completely different and so things like a page turning button for the iPad make the world of difference and when this technology goes wrong that's when things get really exciting um, I was playing at Exeter Cathedral a couple of weeks ago and one of the organists there sent me a video of an experience he had had a couple of weeks earlier where he turned up to practice the organ and it was playing itself so <laughs> that he wasn't touching it and random stops were coming in and out and random notes were just going Mah! really really loudly and they had no idea why and organs could do that they're temperamental beasts it's a ghost in the machine yeah exactly. <laughs> well you'll be performing Sanson's famous organ symphony this year at the proms would it be right to call this piece the apogee of the French symphonic organ tradition? This is a really interesting question because actually the Saint-Saëns is kind of not an organ symphony in the sense that we've just been talking about. It's a symphony with organ. Uh, so, I mean, Saint-Saëns has played the organ himself and he wrote this symphony which has a, an organ part. It's not actually a particularly substantial organ part. It's very loud at the end, <laughs> but the organ sits doing nothing, or the organist sits doing nothing for quite a lot of it. And I think this is one of those pieces where uh, over time we have elevated the organ part. And so everyone now expects that huge apocalyptic C major chord to come in at that <laughs> big moment. And actually it's only marked forte in the score. We don't get fortissimo until later on. So it's one of these things where actually it's quite funny as a performer because you think, okay, well, I'm playing on the Albert Hall organ. I really want to be quite loud there. <laughs> but if we're being stylistically accurate, it doesn't need to be that loud. And you're stuck in this sort of tension between the little little girl inside of me that just desperately wants to play it really, really, really loudly <laughs> and wanting to do what it actually says in the score. Well, we can sample the organ symphony performed by Olivier Lattery, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and conducted by Christoph Eschenbach. As you said, this will be performed at the proms, and I imagine the famous Albert Hall Willis organ presents a different challenge from the Ely instrument that you recorded your album on. How are you preparing for the challenge of taking on such an, such an instrument, and are you ever intimidated by the sheer scale of some organs? Yes, they are <laughs> scary. Uh, so when I, told, when I told someone that I had this gig that I was doing the proms, they said, can you even reach the top of the stop jam? Because I'm quite short, I'm only five foot three. They are quite intimidating, but I mean, that's the joy of being an organist is turning up to a new instrument and being able to kind of play around and find the ways to make it sing in the way you want it to sing. Um, in terms of preparing for it, uh, spending a lot of time with the stop list, which probably sounds awfully academic, but going through the stop list and trying to plan in advance what kind of sounds I'm going to be using so that then when I turn up, um, we have, end up getting a sort of a midnight practice session to 
program all the sounds that we want to hopefully speed up that process because there are so many different stops that it can be a little bit overwhelming. And then I think the other side of things is just being prepared to change everything when the orchestra comes in because it's all very well setting up your sounds on a, in a completely empty hall with no orchestra but obviously it's going to change when the audience comes in and then when we actually have the orchestra together it will be a case of thinking about balances and being prepared to just change everything that I've already set up. <laughs> and that's a different challenge for every different organ in every different acoustic. Yeah, completely. And also, I mean, so for, for example, the, uh, the Britain that, we, that I've recorded, that is one where there are a lot of different sounds that you have to set. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot, you have to keep going through lots of different settings. And you have to do a lot of those changes very, very fast. So the way I tend to do it is using my right foot. There's a plus button which takes you onto the next sound. I tend to use my right foot for that button. But that button is in slightly different places on every instrument. So it's all very well getting your muscle memory used to kicking out to a certain place, but you might come to a new organ and you have to kick out, I don't know, a metre or half a metre further to the right. And the most recent performance I gave of it, the button was right next to the 32 foot reed button. So I had to be really careful. Every time I did this reflex reflexive kick, I had to be so careful that I didn't touch the wrong one and make the organ suddenly roar. Luckily I didn't. But... Fantastic. Well, one of the most intriguing tracks from Anna Lapwood's new album represents a completely different side of the organ from the bombast of the organ symphony. Anna, can you introduce Alexandra Gilmore's arrangement of the slow movement of Debussy's intimate string quartet? This is one of the most extraordinary pieces to play. It calls on um, a lot of string sounds on the organ and uh, there, there's a technique that we can do where pipes are tuned slightly differently so it creates a shimmering sound a little bit like the sound of um, strings and vibrato and so yeah this Debussy calls for that quite a lot uh, my favourite bit of it is at the end when after this quite sort of tumultuous middle section this big build up with all these very rich sounds it comes right back down and we get the recap of the opening theme. And there's, you can just about hear the pedal stops, but you more feel them than hear them. They kind of just vibrate underneath everything else. And to play that is such an extraordinary feeling because it's a little bit like if you have an orchestra playing pianissimo and you know that the organ can be louder than that. You know it can be 50, 60, 70 times louder than that, but you're holding all that power and just playing something that is so much more restrained and intimate and beautiful and moving. Uh, and for me, I think that's sort of the point of the entire album is to try and showcase that side of the instrument as opposed to, look at me, I can play very loud. Let's sample and a spectacular pianissimo playing is an excerpt from the slow movement of the Debussy string quartet arranged for organ by Alexandra Gilmore. Was it a challenge to get the right recording atmosphere on this recording? As I say, the, uh, you're going for a very different style of organ performance than we might usually expect. Yeah, it's hard when you're trying to do all this quite quiet music to get the balance between um, uh, sound that will come across okay on streaming software and things like that and the sound of the room, because obviously you're in this vast space. There's a lot of room noise that just uh, happens and a sort of hiss, I guess. And we went back and forth so many times when we were doing the final edits and master and everything like that and thinking about that balance because I was very clear that I didn't want it to be something very close-miked. I wanted to capture 
the real sense of space. Um, I think the way I described it when I was talking to the producer and the engineer about it is that when you're an organist and you walk in to a cathedral and it's completely pitch black, sound seems to move slightly differently. Sound tend, it, it travels slightly differently. It's like there's a, a bed of darkness there the whole time and then the sound sits on top of that. And that's what I wanted to convey in the recording. I hope that's what we've managed to do. It's, uh, yeah, it was tricky. Well, as you mentioned at the start of the show, you also play the harp as well as being a choral conductor. Do these help bring a fresh perspective to the organ, an instrument which perhaps has been labelled as a bit anoraki? <laughs> I mean, I love wearing an anorak, so... <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think it has made me think slightly differently about things. I guess one side of it is the repertoire, in that I have been drawn, particularly in the last four years or so, I've been continuously drawn back to orchestral transcriptions because it's music I used to play as a harpist but I had to sit counting a lot of bars rest whereas now I get to play it all which is quite nice so I guess that side of things um yeah I don't know if I would have that had I not played the harp I mean I've been doing another transcription which I actually haven't recorded yet but um I've been playing Elgar's Dream of Grontius, The Prelude and Angel's Farewell, and I went through that transcription and added in the harp part all the way through, because for me, I can't hear it without it. And so you also conduct choirs, and obviously now it's perhaps a bit crude to say so, but the method of making music between a choir and an organ is perhaps quite similar, it's blowing air. Do you try and find a choral-esque sound when playing the organ, and vice versa? Does the playing of the organ influence how you conduct choirs? I don't know, actually. That's a very good question. I think I find them very different experiences. Um, uh, there can be moments, so for example, if I've just been conducting Evensong, and uh, when you're conducting, you're waiting for other people to process your musical thoughts, but it has to go through their brains as well. So it's kind of, there's there's one more step of removal from the music. And so it can occasionally be the best feeling in the world to then just go and play the organ and know that what you are thinking comes out straight away uh, musically that can be that can be really really nice but on the other hand as I said before playing the organ is a very lonely pursuit uh, and you are by yourself you you've only got yourself to blame if it goes wrong uh, but and whereas working with a choir you're bringing together everyone's different musical thoughts into a cohesive whole and that is a, an amazing feeling uh, so I think, they're, yeah, they're quite different, I would say. But they complement each other well, you'd say? Yeah, definitely. Personally, the most anticipated work on the album is your spectacular arrangement of Benjamin Britten's four C interludes from Peter Grimes. What was the inspiration and the challenges behind this arrangement? Well, uh, this is music that I very much grew up with. My dad uh, grew up in Suffolk, and so every family holiday used to be going and uh, going on wet, windy walks on those Suffolk beaches. I'm sure everyone who's been there will know exactly what I mean. They, it tends to rain, but they're so atmospheric. And he was musical growing up. He actually played for Benjamin Britten. He always teases me about this because I can never beat it. He played... That's quite uh, a in, name drop, isn't it? I know. He <laughs> played in a performance of Noah's Flood and Britten came up and tapped him on the shoulder and said, well played. Oh, I will never goodness. beat that. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it, it, I kind of grew up with that area in my head and my dad played me Britain's music when I was a child and then as a harpist I played the 40 interludes uh, with the MYO and I remember at the time falling in love with the orchestration and the harmony and just everything about it I couldn't get enough of this music so more recently uh, I was asked to do a recital at uh, as part of Albra Festival and they said could you play some Britain and there isn't much Britain organ music. There's a little bit, but n not much. And they're not particularly substantial pieces. So I thought, ah, well, I could see if Dawn might work on the organ. And I gave it a go and thought, oh, actually, hang on a minute. This works really well. Maybe I'll try Moonlight too. And then Slippery Slope. Uh, <laughs> and well, then lockdown hit. And so the actual recital got cancelled. But I was then very much hooked into this project and actually my favourite music, my favourite movements ended up being Sunday Morning because it just, I cannot describe how satisfying it is to play. It's hard, it's very hard, but you're doing, in your left hand you're doing those horn chords, the overlapping horn chords, 
uh, in your right hand you're doing the first melody and then your feet on a two foot you're doing the other melody and it's all kind of jostling with itself but the first moment I took that to Ely uh, and then did this big build up that happens in the middle of the movement I just went hang on a minute this has gone from a little project in my head to something that I'm actually indescribably excited about. Yes, and it wasn't a setup, but Sunday morning is actually my favourite of the four as well. So let's sample that <laughs> performed by, of course, Anna Lapwood. <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges of that movement was finding the best way to replicate those horn chords because it's such a distinctive sound, uh, this, uh, the sforzando that happens on each chord. And I tried so many different things. I mean, I probably spent about two weeks just thinking about those chords. And in the end, what I did was I had the, those chords in the left hand and then used my feet with a similar sound, but tiny bit louder, a reedy sound. And I just punctuated the very, very beginning of each chord so that it gave it that little accent. Um, and I hope it, I hope it works. I think it's rather fun to play. If Bach represents the Baroque organ, symphonic organ, the Romantic, with pieces on this album by Ravel and Debussy, and of course the Benjamin Britten Force interludes, are you staking a claim on the, on the album for the organ as a capable of musical impressionism? Not something we would associate with it. I wouldn't have said staking a claim, but um, it, I guess I guess so. I mean, I uh, it goes back to this idea of trying to make the organ a little bit more accessible. And I think what was sort of going through my head when I was putting together the track list and the running order, other than the fact that it's just some of my favourite music to play, uh, selfishly, I wanted to kind of include my, my favourites. But I just thought maybe it could work to take music that people don't associate with the instrument, but they love and then show them that the organ is capable of making that music just as beautiful uh, as anything else. And I think, yeah, I mean, the Ravel, I think it works beautifully for the instrument, the Follin in particular, is very cheeky. Um, the F, and also the more contemporary music, I mean, the Cheryl Francis Hode that ends the whole disc. It's gloriously silly. It's just, I mean, there's a moment at the end, it's this huge build up and this motif that comes back all the way through. Da, da, da. Massive, massive build up, all guns blazing, every sound you could possibly imagine on the organ. And then it suddenly drops back to nothing, and you think, has something gone wrong? Have they pressed the wrong button? And you just hear these three notes left behind, and then that melody comes back on an eight foot flute. And you think, oh, that's nice. And then out of nowhere, she adds in this huge chord just that ends the whole thing and I just think that's what the organ is about it's about surprising people it's about making them laugh it's about making them smile it's about having a sense of humour uh, certainly for me that's what it's all about and it's actually something of an amalgam of the themes we've discussed as it features the organ voluntaries and as someone once mentioned that, about Cheryl Francis Hode a little cheese cheese is important <laughs> I think what's life without cheese Fantastic. Well, let's have an excerpt of Taking Your Leave from Images, the final track on the album.
Well, now that the album will be released on September the 3rd, what are your next projects? Well, the proms are kind of the big thing looming. Uh, so I'm obviously performing the Saint-Saëns and then I'm also presenting uh, the Matthew Passion, which is the penultimate night. Uh, so that's something nice to look forward to. And then the following week, I'm doing the Saint-Saëns with the CBSO. So another fun orchestral project. I've, all, I've just finished recording an album with our girls choir, an album of Upper Voices music. So I'm really excited to start listening to the edits of that and share that with the world. And then just hoping for a return to normal next year, really. Hoping that our choirs at Pembroke can sing together properly again and we can go back to having nice full chapels roaring out hymns with descants. Fantastic one. Well, there's something to look forward to. And the final track, Taking Your Leave, is sadly providing us with our instructions, as we now must do likewise. Good luck, Anna, with the album release and all the other aspects of your career, which is proving to be as multifaceted as you've shown the organ to be today. Thanks to my producer, Matt Groom, and thanks to you for listening. Thank you so much.